negative 6% arrival. That's the closest charger I've double checked. So uh, let's go for it. Let's hypermile this thing. I think we can do it. Hello, good morning, and welcome to beautiful Napa, California. You join me in one of the most beautiful places with one of my favorite electric cars, the Audi e-tron. And it's now been updated and it's now called the Q8 e-tron. So this is sort of the refresh of the car that we own. You guys know we own an Audi e-tron. It's Alyssa's car. She loves it, daily drives it. And um, you know, it's one of those cars that I just can't pry from her. So I wanna see if the new one's better. Should we even upgrade to the new one? A lot of questions here. And uh, Audi invited us out to come experience this car for the day. So I'm gonna walk you through the spec. I'm now gonna drive the updated one for the first time and take you along with me for my very first impressions of driving the new updated Q8 e-tron. And here it is. This particular version is the Q8 e-tron Sportback, which means it kind of slopes in the rear. Audi says about uh, 10 to 20 percent of all e-trons are Sportbacks, and the reason I actually selected the Sportback is, you guys know, I'm not a huge Sportback or coupified SUV fan. By the way, you can see now going forward, all Audi models will have this model designation etched into the side B pillars there. Very interesting. But I thought, okay, Okay, it's probably a good idea to film the sport back to experience it. The chassis tuning should be identical. Basically, B pillar forward should feel the same as the SUV. And then Audi's going to send a review unit out to Colorado so we can actually run the SUV against our current e-tron. And so there's a lot of stuff to do with the SUV. And I thought since we're here and I probably won't have the opportunity to drive a sport back again, let's at least get the sport back driving review in now. I've never driven an e-tron sport back. And again, very minor differences here, more of a shape thing. Personally, I see no reason to go with this over the SUV. You guys know I love the e-tron SUV. It's one of my favorite favorite cars. So let's walk through specs, pricing, what they've actually updated for 2024 now. A lot to get into here and it's all actually really good and needed stuff. So before we get into the nitty gritty, I want to at least let you know the updates for the Q8 e-tron. What does it mean? What does Q8 mean? Well, we all know Audi has a whole bunch of Q models, Q3, 4, 5, six coming q7 is their suv of course and q8 is the top and they have a q8 combustion version I actually was just in an rs q8 yesterday one of my favorite kind of cool that is a cool coupified suv because it's really fast however they've now decided to brand the electric version the q8 e-tron and the reason for this is uh they're signifying this is the top level luxury SUV that they'll be making. It has all the extra glazing on the windows, all the nice leather, the good sound system, all that stuff. So that's first. The second, the most meaningful update is the range. You see, when the e-tron launched, it had huge buffers on the battery. It was mid 90 kilowatt hour battery pack, but you could only use like 83 kilowatt hours. Then after year one, I think going into year two, they also had a software update to retrofit all the earlier cars. You can now use 86.5 kilowatt hours out of it. So for example, our Audi e-tron has roughly 86 kilowatt hour usable battery pack. This is a 106 kilowatt hour usable battery pack. 20 kilowatt hours more usable energy. 114 kilowatt hour gross. So still typical Audi fashion, big buffers here. But that is a massive increase in capacity. Now in terms of charging speed, They've now officially upped the charging speed to 170, 175 kilowatts, uh, but we're going to have to test the curve. The magic of the early e-tron was, yeah, it didn't have much range. I mean, we have the SUV in ours is a 2019. It's an early car, um, but we can get 200 miles out of it uh, in, in a warm day on the highway. And that's not amazing, but it's livable. The best thing about that car, though, is when you get to a charging station, it just holds peak power all the way to 80% roughly and then starts to die off. Even at like 97%, it's still doing 50 kilowatts. The e-tron is one of the best charging electric cars on the market, and it shows that it's all about the curve and not necessarily about the peak. 
So the peak has been updated from a stated 150 now to a 170. We've actually seen 170 kilowatts on our car. Maybe that was a fault of the charging station pushing a little bit too hard. Um, yes, that's actually a problem. I know the car is supposed to request the power, but sometimes things get lost in translation with communications, and maybe I'll do a video on that at some point soon. It has happened and it is pretty sketchy, but we have seen 170 kilowatts on our current e-tron. This one's rated for 170. And uh, we will be doing all the charge testing, the back-to-back, side-to-side charge testing. But this has 20 kilowatt hour more capacity, and it's still the same roughly 30 minute, 10 to 80% time as our car. And that has worked unbelievably well for road trips. So I'm thinking even if the curve isn't as good, as the current car, I think it's still gonna be better than almost anything on the market. So that's the big thing, is the more range. And we really could welcome more range, at least for our e-tron, because by the time we put a roof box on it, put the dogs in it, put the studded winter tires on it, and it's cold and snowy, we're like 120 miles of range, and it is a thirsty beast. So this should be a little bit better in terms of range. But they've also done some things to enhance efficiency. They've added two more windings to the rear motor. They're both uh, actually both motors are asynchronous motors, so non-permanent magnet, and um, they make the same horsepower as before, 402 horsepower utilizing the boost function, so the acceleration is pretty much going to be the same. There is a bit more torque here though, and the uh, way that it can actually hold peak power is a little bit longer than the early car, so now it can hold uh, 0 to 60 and 2 tenths of a second quicker. It's now like 5.2, 5. Uh, yeah, I think 5.2 seconds, 0 to 60 here. So uh, not a racer, but they will have the is it the sq8 sportback e-tron and the sq8 e-tron coming uh towards the end of this year with the tri-motor system i've driven that tri-motor system it's incredible it's really cool and it's got the wide fender flares it looks so good so keep an eye on for that there's some more changes too i'll walk you through briefly and then we're going to go and drive it. so this particular one is a q8 uh, Sportback S-Line e-tron, and it is actually a launch edition. So we're rolling on 22-inch six-segment six spoke design wheels. It's got um, the color combination, just in case you're curious, I'm reading off of this sheet here, is a Daytona gray pearl with flint gray with orange stitching interior. I wanted to have this sheet here just so I could tell you the color combo because they have done one hell of a job on this interior combination. Uh, I was talking to some of the product planners here and that's why I come to these events so I can actually talk to the people who are specking these cars for the US market. Let me just turn off the side marker light so it stops dinging at us. This combination of this orange piping with this uh, sort of gray tan leather, same color seats we have in our car, is so cool it's so neat i love this and it's really meant to reflect the high voltage cabling inside the car they matched the hue and it was all you know sort of a, an e-tron electric vibe really love it now this particular car is optioned with the us charging pack and the charging pack by the way that charge port door is faster than our car so lots of small optimizations here that i'm already noticing um, pretty great so you have your dc charging port your ac charging port here but then the charging pack gives you another port, which was optional on the pre-refresh as well, gives you another port over here, also faster than our car, and it also puts two onboard chargers in there. So, uh, you know, they actually had an original, uh, the, the standard onboard charger is a 48 amp unit. Now, when you get the charging pack, I think they put two of them together and they derate them slightly and you get a maximum of 80 kilowatt AC charging. Wait, 80 kilowatt AC charging? No, 80 amp AC charging, excuse me. You get 19.2 kilowatts or so at home. That's nice, especially with having the bigger battery pack, being able to plug into an 80 amp charger, especially with something that's a top of the line electric SUV in this pricing category, should have an 80 amp onboard charger. Model X does not. Uh, IX does not either. So that is a great key differentiator here for this. We are going to talk about the competitors because I've driven every competitor to this vehicle as well. And to be honest, on paper, this does not stack up as well. But I'm going to explain to you why I actually prefer this for our choice in vehicle and why <laughs> Alyssa will not even consider the other options over at e-tron. There is some special sauce here that we haven't talked about. From a styling perspective, it is updated. And I would argue not as attractive. So in the center of the grill, you get a body color section. I think if you go for a black one, that would look pretty good just to have it all blacked out. Our e-tron, as you know, is fully blacked out and I think looks good. But this is a little bit 
odd. I don't know. Maybe I'm just used to the early ones, but um, it's definitely like a lot going on here. You have larger air inlets for your air curtain, your air scarf around the wheel. You have improved aerodynamics. You're now at a 0.29 coefficient of drag. I think for the SUV down from 0.31, something like that, just a small improvement. You have a little bit wider openings for cooling. You also have in this particular one, the Audi digital matrix lights, which are currently, you know, shut down for the US market. But I actually believe Audi told me they turned it on on this car to do a video. And I think if we drive it at night, which I won't be able to in this video, just because we have to bring it back, uh, it'll actually do the full Euro spec matrix function. So I'm going to see if they're going to let me make a video with it at some point, because I'd love to show you guys what these headlights can do. They're amazing. And US regulation needs to catch up. There's now these new Audi rings that are totally flat, which I really personally don't like at all uh, compared to the 3D effect on the older on the uh, older e-tron. I think it just looks a little bit cheaper. Um, not nearly as premium as having that real touch point there. So from a styling perspective, I'm not sold on the updates. The headlights look pretty much the same. The front's gotten a little bit busier, but it's not bad. I think it still looks way better than iX and it still looks way better than Model X. This by far is a premium car. It also is going to compete with the Genesis GV70, a car that we've been making some videos with recently. And what else is in this category? Well, I guess not too much. It's not as big as Model X, but it's certainly priced in the same area. Back seat room, unchanged. The interior space is unchanged from the early ones. You have the same touch controls, beautiful glass roof. This is all the same as the outgoing model. As far as I can tell, all this trim, same as our car. The shades all looks normal, same. Soft closed doors, let's see. It should, yes launch edition has everything the one thing this launch edition doesn't have compared with the early launch edition is actually night vision the very early e-trons that came to the u.s had night vision and audi was saying it was like a one or two percent take rate so they didn't even bother putting it in this one but if you ever see an e-tron with night vision i know a few owners who have one that's pretty cool inside literally identical let me show you in here you have the same storage compartment as the outgoing model same screens I can kick on the car here and show you all of this. Operates identically. Welcome Audi Q8 e-tron. The steering wheel, slightly different. We have an extra little, I would say, four-spoke situation here where you have like a little grab handle. The wheel is still just as nice as the outgoing model. I would say the other one looks a little bit more premium, a little bit more A8-like. This is maybe slightly sportier, but it's also an S-line car. So I don't know what happens if you don't get the S-line. Software is the same, Bang & Olufsen sound system is still the same. In the US, this is the top spec sound system and it rips, it sounds so good. Air conditioning controls are the same, massaging seats, the same, just amazing. And I uh, highly recommend getting one of these fully specced out. So let me walk you through the specs. Let's get in, let's drive it. We're gonna be looking for those minor differences from last generation to this one. So you have three main option packages for the e-tron, you have the premium which is going to be the base car still comes with tons of standard equipment this is a q8 e-tron after all so it's gonna come pretty nicely specced then you can get the premium plus which is going to add like ventilated seats and a few other things and that's probably going to be the volume model and i encourage you to go to audi's website and spec out your dream e-tron but that's what most people will go with however i highly 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 recommend going for the prestige it's 10 grand over the base car but you get so much you you get the great sound system you get the much higher quality interior materials you get even little things that they don't tell you about at least in the early cars it was double glazing on the windows and just lots of really nice things in the prestige pack ours you know is a prestige and Alyssa's like i wouldn't even consider an e-tron if it didn't have the massaging seats so you know just those little things highly recommend going for a high spec e-tron all of the little differences they put in that package really lead to a better daily experience and we're speaking from experience as owners really like the top spec model and then for the first year uh, you have the first edition or the launch edition and uh, that's what this one is here so it basically comes with everything big wheels good color trim choices but it's a fully spec car just with some trim differences to denote the first model year of the car anyway let's get in camera it up go for our first well you join me inside of the new q8 e-tron and the first thing we have to do of course is put on the massaging seats as we always talk about 
and I'll go for the revitalization option. So let's go into drive, take off the parking brake. We're on a pretty steep hill here and off we go. The first few inches in the new e-tron. Now we're charged up to about 95% or so. And let me just double check that. To see the actual percentage, you have to go to vehicle and then charging. They've actually simplified a menu here. So it's one less menu to go through. We're at 95% state of charge and the vehicle's predicting 274 miles at 95%. Uh, that is a number we have never seen on our car. So. Wow, big, much more range here. But is it as much range as the iX or Model X? We'll have to talk about those two vehicles towards the end and where I think this vehicle fits into its competitive segment and where I think it's actually almost the only option, at least for us, and why we are so into the e-tron thing for our own personal vehicle choice. So uh, it's a little bit weird because I'm here test driving the new car, of course, and uh, I'm test driving it to see if we should buy one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not necessarily making this video for you guys for a review. I'm here selfishly because I want to see if it's worth the upgrade over our car. <laughs> so, uh, you know, kind of fun things. We are in beautiful Healdsburg, California, just outside of Napa, up in the wine country. And we're actually going to go on a cool route that Audi has planned out. Typically, I don't go on these route things, um, but there's not enough time today to do a lot of testing. And it's like a four hour loop of going, you know, of twisty hardcore roads over to the PCH, back on some highway. So we'll really get a feel for how the car drives in different scenarios. And instantly pulling out right now, um, I'm noticing actually quite a few differences over our car, but the general package is all here. It's so quiet. Um, but I'm noticing more immediacy on the accelerator pedal and things like that. To me, this is just a tuning update and change. So the big situation is the range and then all the small stuff. Things like they've stiffened the dampers for the lower control arms, the bushing, so that you have a little bit better steering feel, which is one thing that we don't have in our cars, any steering feel. The car just feels more agile and easier to turn in, Audi tells me. So I'm looking forward to getting it on some twisty roads. I've actually done a full track review of the e-tron 55, the big SUV, um, back in 2019 or 2020 when it first launched. My friend Nick let me borrow his car. I and we did towing tests with it, range tests, and, and a track test in North Carolina at the old track. And um, we had full lift off oversteer, like the car was balanced really well. Audi, like instead of understeering everywhere, figured out what needed to happen for these things and made it amazing. And so I'm really uh, excited to see now that they've upped the improvement and that we have the sport summer, well, we have the summer tires on the 22 inch wheels. We should have even maybe a little bit better turn in response. The steering ratio has been shrunk now, so it's you don't have to yank the wheel around so much. It's got more presence on center. So in our car, we actually have to put a lot of steering input in on center. Here, wow, night and day difference on the steering immediately, I can tell you that. Now, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? These are the things we'll have to find out. But first of all, let's see how the acceleration is. The motors have slightly changed, like I mentioned, a little bit more windings. We're gonna go dynamic S mode. I'm in auto hold, I'm just gonna floor it at the light. More immediate off the line. Yes, no question it feels quicker than our car. And just not necessarily in the total peak power output, but in the way that it's delivering the power. Off the line, bam, much better hit. The one thing with our e-tron is it really does not like to get moving from a start, and that's partially because it doesn't use a permanent magnet motor. It uses uh, you know, induction motors, which you gotta build up some speed to get the magnetic field to really go and rip. Uh, but this definitely has a bit more kick off the line, and it held the boost function longer than our as well. Now, granted, we are at high state of charge. As you lose state of charge, you get really low, that boost function goes away. So just figuring out some of these differences here. Now, we are on some bumpy roads and I can feel it's actually stiffer than I've ever felt in our car. Let's go back to comfort. Instantly just took away all those harsh inputs. So Audi also tells me that the breadth of difference in the drive modes is huge. I mean, just a big separation. So that uh, I'm already noticing that it's, it's you know, also a wheel and tire choice that we don't have on our car and the earlier models, but also just the difference between comfort and sport and all road has just been expanded. So the spider chart of what this car can do uh, has, has expanded, which is really kind of neat. Um, overall, the seating position is the same. 
the materials feel the same. It feels very high quality, very nice. I love the seating position in this car. You guys know I've spent a lot of time in e-tron. We've driven ours across the country and it's one of those cars you just don't get tired of at all. Also a nice upgrade for 2024 for the Q8 is all of the driver assistance is now standard in the vehicle as it should be. So you get lane centering and adaptive cruise control, all which works okay. I mean, it's not Tesla autopilot, but um, you know, it, it gets the job done just sitting in the middle of the lane on the highway. It does everything you kind of need it to do. And I think we're actually about to jump on the 101. So I do want to try that out as well. So the initial, like, if you were to just take me out of uh, our existing, you know, previous e-tron, the pre-refresh and drop me in here, looking, feeling, touching, aside from the steering wheel, which could just be a trim choice, it's all the same, no differences. And that's good because that all works really well. Uh, that is the best part about this car is actually the touch points. I really like Audi's MMI. There's so many settings, so many functions, but it all works. Um, and so it takes some time to learn the system, but once you have it down, it's actually fairly powerful what you can do. And of course you get CarPlay if you want it. You can wireless CarPlay over and, and just you know get everything set up once and then you're good to go. So let's jump on the 101. I'm gonna pull the shifter into S. So it still has the two drive logic modes, which is driving without boost. And then when you drop the shifter into S mode, um, at least when you're in comfort, it unlocks the full power. And you know, the boost function's an interesting one. We should maybe do a whole video on it. I won't harp on it in this particular one, but let's just see in comfort mode. I'm gonna kind of hoon it onto the highway here. Traction control, full power now. Sustained, sustained performance. Okay, felt really good to about 80 miles an hour there and then it kind of uh, derated right at 80. So that is a massive improvement from our car. Well, anyway, let's just set our speed. We have cruise control on, we have lane centering uh, on right there. So let's see how it does. And I'll actually put on the uh, lane centering menu so you guys can see the driver assistance. Pull the speed in, the distance in a little bit. We are getting off just up here, but on the highway, 70 miles an hour, dead silent, comfortable. Does the stuff lane centering working well I'm pulling us off this is where it wants us to go now we have a couple different levels of regen so I can pull the left paddle to go same strategy as our car which is not much off throttle regen no one pedal driving nothing similar so they really want you to interact with the brake pedal the Taycan is the same way and you know coming from Tesla originally and we still have our Teslas but it's a totally different one pedal experience or driving experience than the Teslas are. And so one thing that I've actually learned to appreciate with our e-tron is utilizing the brake pedal and feeling the unbelievably good tuning. A little bit of body porpoising through here. Are you seeing this? Our car doesn't really porpoise <laughs> like this. It, the rear end bounces, but here I'm feeling the whole thing moving around. Um, the brake pedal feels good in this car and it feels maybe even slightly better and less clicks. Just lots of small optimizations from the early ones that I'm really picking up on that I, that I quite like. So we're going on some back roads, doing a little bit of twisty stuff. I'll catch up with you guys in a minute. I knew I just threw a bunch of information out at you. Um, I'm gonna soak in the car a bit and then we'll actually get into evaluating the differences. But I always like to take you along for my very first driving moments of any car. And right now, all I'm feeling is all the good from our existing e-tron is here and just the improvements are minor, but seemingly so far really nice. Well, now you join me on some uh, back beautiful winding roads. Let's throw this thing into dynamic. The air suspension will drop slightly. Uh, just totally noticing driving around lots of small little adaptations, particularly to the inputs, the accelerator pedal, the brake pedal. Let's give it the beans down here. Yeah, so 80 miles an hour, the boost seems to cut away and it has like this ledge that it falls off. Our car, I've never felt that before. Uh, top speed of 200 kilometers per hour, about 120 miles an hour, 124, I believe. And, uh, you know, that's fine. You don't need to go in much more than that. So much different character. That was the first corner I just hit 
and it's totally different. The one thing that is the same, anytime you get any G load, you start hearing clicking from the ESP systems here. So what I can do is I can actually back down the stability control systems in, in three settings. You have full on, you have ESC sport, and then you have ESC full off. So here in ESC sport, let's hustle it through some corners. We are on the summer tires, so we'll go in pretty hot. Big power on the exit, nice, gets in. So much less steering input needed here. Big brakes on the entry into the corner. Oh, it feels great. Oh, totally different character than I've ever felt in a non-S e-tron. So if you guys haven't watched the video, I drove the tri-motor tri Audi e-tron, the S e-tron S, I think is what it's called. Now they move the S to a different place. Pretty confusing. Um, but basically I drove the tri-motor in Italy on some rally roads and absolutely sent it. 500 horsepower. Things amazing. Um, this is a whole new character for the standard car. And what's nice is you don't seem to give up any comfort. I drove it around in comfort mode and it definitely changes the way that the car moves around a little bit, the extra weight. What's crazy is the battery pack is 20 kilowatt hours more, but it only weighs 60 pounds more car to car. So they must have pulled some weight out of somewhere else. Uh, the efficiency, I doubt, has changed that much. I don't know. But look at these corners that we're coming through here. Really nice, right on the edge of the front tire. Car is balanced, it changes direction so much better. Wow, just the way this thing gets through the corners is a whole new level of awesome. So the dynamic portion is good. Let's go full ESP off because I'm still feeling it kick in a little bit. So there, stabilization control, ESC off. We'll progressively lean on the throttle through this corner. Full beans on the exit nice stays out of our way that's the nice thing the Germans let you do they just go full off give you great drivetrain line, drive line controls and you're good to go you guys know we did a um, a winter test event on a frozen uh, circuit that we built with Nokian tires and uh, we had our e-tron out there on the studded Nokian tires and Alyssa was sending that thing sideways doing 70 mile an hour drifts four-wheel drifts skidding through uh, on the snow and icy surface and one thing we all came away with was feeling just how nice Audi tuned that car um, to handle even though the regular e-tron's not really meant for anything sporty and it's just kind of the German thing to do I can hear my suitcase flying around in the back because I just drove in flew in to drive this thing um, yeah so this by far is a new character to the car more fun more agile even than the e-tron s with the steering the steering's the big takeaway much less slop out of it really wants to get into the corner and i would say audi was like it gives you 10 percent better steering feel i don't know what metric they calculate off of steering feel um, i would say yes it's not there's not much feedback coming through here but not much is better than the zero that we had and i'm sorry i know the cameras are probably moving around here i still can't figure out the stabilization settings on these things um, but look at this just leaning into the brake pedal. I would say our brake pedal is almost a bit sharper once you get into it. Full power on exit. She rockets down the straightaway, back onto the brake pedal, back into a corner, through the bridge, rally style, full send through the bridge. <laughs> this is a beautiful road for this car. And never would you think that the fat e-tron would be this agile and this fun to hoon around. So great drivetrain performance, still sustained power. Again, that 80 mile an hour dip right there. But um, no question they've made it more dynamic. Uh, so I'm glad we checked that off our box. I'm going to enjoy some more driving on these roads. There's not much more to tell you other than, yes, all of the extra bushing work, the front end geometry work on this thing from steering to suspension has made this a lot more fun but should the e-tron be fun should it be dynamic i'm not a hundred percent sure i just need to make sure they didn't compromise on the daily driving comfort stuff because to me very important wow the lateral grip on these tires is very impressive i kind of hucked it through there pretty quick <laughs> this thing freaking boogies on this road okay i'm gonna have some more fun i'll see y'all in a little bit when we can test more cruising stuff never thought i'd have fun in e-tron on a back road but here we are and i should say a non-s e-tron this is just the standard car it's this good wow better steering feel than ix and way better than model x man is audi out bmwing bmw <laughs> i really need to drive them back to back but 
this is definitely more fun than IX on a back road, for me at least. I love the way the thing feels and I can sit low. All right, see you all in a little bit. You now join me on the beautiful Pacific Coast Highway where I feel like we're driving a little bit more e-tron style. I've taken it out of dynamic mode even though we're on some of the best drive, well not best driving roads, good twisty roads but they're always just filled with tourists and traffic so you can never really send it on this road. But this is the e-tron thing. I've configured my individual drive profile to be sporty drivetrain comfort steering and comfort suspension. There's actually three levels of suspension, steering, and drivetrain. Uh, you know, basically comfort, balanced, and sport uh, for most of the, the chassis tuning stuff. And I wanted to, now that I've spent, I don't know, an hour or so driving this vehicle around, talk about the comfort aspect. So let's go all weather lights on because we're coming into some typical California coastal fog, which is just dramatic and beautiful and always one of the best backdrops to drive a car and uh, you know I've been thinking a little bit about the e-tron and you know the fact that it's better in a dynamic standpoint doesn't actually mm, matter for the use case of the vehicle this thing is now fun on a back road but no, I don't you know we have a lot of viewers that drive each I don't really see them shredding up canyons so the big thing for me is the comfort and before I get to the comfort, I want to talk about the MMI system, the usability, the software, the driver assistance. All of that is largely the same with some minor exceptions. The driver assistance system seems to be better than our car, than the earlier cars. It seems to track the lanes better. It seems to do a better job. Now, on a road like this, it's not going to really be doing this uh, type of driving. But I was on some op more open roads earlier, and it definitely was able to do a lot more than I felt our car could ever do. Uh, the other thing is the sound system. This one has the Bang & Olufsen sound system. I don't think it's quite as good as, and I know for sure it's not as good as our car. Now, is that a sport back thing, or is that they just removed the massive rear subwoofer thing? I don't know. Uh, definitely a reconfigured sound system than what I'm used to previously. There's another e-tron sport back, same spec just in front of us, uh, two cars ahead. In front of the folks on their Nissan Rogue Trip. Um, so the sound system's still phenomenal. It's great. The IX Bowers and Wilkins and the, and our early e-tron Bang & Olufsen are better than this, but this is still one of the best in the industry. So, you know, don't don't harp too much on the sound system thing. It's just the the mids and the highs are all there. It's just the uh, the base. It's lacking the base. And then um, you know that wouldn't deter me from getting a new one or upgrading or anything like that. Like that. But the one thing that does have me slightly concerned about this new car is the ride comfort. Uh, no question, it's not more comfortable than the outgoing model. If anything, I think it's slightly less comfortable. You see, the e-trons have always been very soft, very wafty and floating, and I enjoy that. I think it's nice to have almost a Rolls-Royce-like driving experience going down the road. It was amazing. It was not good at handling, but it was very good at just soaking up the bumps on a long trip with that big air suspension system. And um, from a comfort perspective, when I lock the suspension in, in normal comfort mode, which is how we drive our car most of the time and how I imagine most e-tron owners drive their cars most of the time, I'm noticing a couple things. The first is in terms of smoothing out the small bumps, probably equal. Um, this one has one inch larger wheels. We have 21s on our car. This one's on 22s. So, um, but, but I'm also noticing just ways that the suspension behaves is differently. So um, there's quite a bit more body porpoising over bumps. The e-tron's always had a loose back end. If you ever see one driving down the highway, you'll watch it kind of wiggle the butt. <laughs> the butt will just bounce everywhere. But sitting in the driver's seat, you don't actually really feel the butt moving up and down so much. Um, but you can tell when you look in the rearview mirror. I think they tried to tune some of that rear body motion out with this suspension refresh. And now the whole car kind of pendulums on over the driver. So, you know, I thought at first, like when we first got in the car, I mentioned it to you in this video. And then I was like, you know what? I think it's definitely more pendulum-y. I'm not a great suspension engineer, so forgive me for not giving you the most descriptive terminology. Um, it's not as uh, comfortable or smooth as you would expect compared to the last one. It's still more comfortable than Model X. It's still more comfortable than iX. 
but um, and I again I spent most of my time in the IX M60 which was the sporty one and you can hear the brake pedal clicking away ESP stuff going on just to probably grab a little bit of brake to send power to the outside there even in comfort mode so yeah I would say need some more time to digest this but my initial impressions from the comfort side of thing are it's not more comfortable than the outgoing model now I need to drive an SUV and confirm it's not just a sport back thing they tell me the suspensions nearly identical car to car I believe that um, but I just need to double check with an SUV. Anyway, beautiful drive here. Um, you know, if we ignore the previous model and just look at this car in a vacuum, uh, this is still, I think, one of the best electric SUVs on the market. Charges great, fairly good range, unbelievably high quality materials in here. The ride is still fantastic. Its breadth of capabilities has increased from the last one, but it's now got a sporting edge to it, which it did not have before. And so overall, you know, if you're cross shopping this new, then definitely it's worth going for the new one over the previous one. I've made that determination, even just the range increase alone. But if you have the existing one, you're thinking about upgrading. I'm not convinced yet. Really, I'm not convinced yet, unless the range is that big of a deal to you, which it's really not to us. Um, yeah, more testing to do. Good thing I got another couple hours behind the wheel. Well, I've now uh, spoken to some of the product guys here at the event. That is one of the nice things about coming to these events is to talk to some of the staff and uh, you know figure out how they helped engineer the car and package the car specifically for our market. Um, I just took the YouTube thumbnail, so I'm going to take it out of efficiency. I wanted the suspension slam, and we'll raise it up to comfort. So um, a couple things that I've noticed so far. I asked them about the sound system differences, and they, they say it's the same sound system as the outgoing model. It could just be a sport back change. Similar with the suspension as well. So perhaps the sport back rides a touch firmer, a touch sportier, maybe a touch more porpoisey than the full size e-tron. But um, other than that, the improvements, they're like, yeah, there's so many small little changes to this car that they've done sort of behind the scenes that it's just like too many to list. Just lots of little optimizations here and there. And I'm definitely feeling those as we're driving through. So um, let's continue. We got more driving to do. Beautiful Pacific Coast Highway today. Awesome place. And uh, certainly the right kind of car to... Uh, to be enjoying this thing. The e-tron's always been a great cruiser. I did learn that there's less cobalt in the battery pack and the buffers have changed slightly, which is why it doesn't have the flat curve that the earlier cars did. And it's also how they were able to remove some weight out of it actually was uh, some of the cobalt reduction they claim at least was due to the weight. It's not less uh, heavy. It's 60 pounds heavier roughly than the outgoing model. But again, um, the battery capacity is much higher. So great conversation with some of the Audi guys. They're very interested to hear my feedback as, you know, an owner of one of these, of course. And, um, you know, I was sharing Alyssa's thoughts as well as what she uses the car for. And they love that we had studded tires on it and use it, you know, as a hardcore um, use case, which we do. And so uh, just the extra battery range on this would be a night and day difference. But even here, cruising in comfort mode, the car's so much tighter, so much more taut. Um, and, and much more responsive, so much less front end deflection than we have in our, uh, our outgoing e-tron. So I'll sort of uh, see if we can get to some higher speeds, see how this thing feels in the highway, maybe perhaps, and then we'll end the video with my final thoughts and the changes and whether or not I think we will go or not go for a Q8 e-tron over our existing one. It's kind of, kind of uh, an interesting situation here for sure. Well, you join me closer to the end of the run and uh, a whole bunch of other e-trons here, of course, they're all coming in 40, 50, 60% state of charge. We are at 10. So <laughs> uh, we actually don't have enough range to make it over to where we have to go, uh, which means we got to go find a charger so Audi doesn't yell at me for draining the car and driving it too fast, driving it properly, I would say. I was like, when I looked at the route plan, I'm like, are they serious? Do they know how we drive? And I guess I drive quicker than most other people, apparently. So this thing is, I got it in range mode, efficiency mode. <laughs> Let's go limp it over to the closest charger, which is almost 40 miles away. So I'm going to deploy all the range tactics. I really thought they had chargers here for some reason, but they don't. So 
Off we go then. Okay, for the efficiency test, let's put in everything we need to do. First of all, what's our state of charge? 16%. Okay, that's pretty low. Um, what we need to do is we need to go here to Audi Drive Select, and we're going to go to efficiency mode. Boom. We're then going to touch range mode, which is different than in range mode in our car, and select range mode. So range mode is on. There we go. It's predicting 32 miles of range. Everyone else rolling in probably with more energy. Nice for them. We are going to go do this. Now, I don't think I can actually make it to a charging station that I can find the maximum charging curve, but step one is don't give Audi back a dead car. So now let's see if this thing can actually help us find any high power chargers. The Audi Nav isn't bad. It does pretty good calculations. So here's a high power charger in Cloverdale right on the way back. Charge point says 235 kilowatt. Okay, maybe it's one of the new charge point expresses. It says it's 41 miles. Okay, 41 miles. It says we would get there. It cannot be reached. Negative 6% arrival. That's the closest charger I've double checked. So uh, let's go for it. Let's hypermile this thing. I think we can do it. 16% to go 41 miles. Oh, it might be tight, but uh... <laughs> I got regen in the manual mode set to max so we can recapture on the D cell. But of course we want to maximize coasting. And one thing we should do is let's do a little efficiency run. So we'll go here, long-term memory. Yeah, I've really been ripping this thing pretty hard 1.7 miles per kilowatt hour i mean i really don't feel like i've been driving it that fast been driving it normally but me normal might be i guess slightly different reset values with okay there we go let's go rip it over to the charger and see how this thing charges we are pulling all the range tricks out i'm in neutral coasting down the hill doing everything we can to eke every last drop out of this thing just moving over for some construction workers there so coasting is the most efficient so let's go windows up and just coast on down this hill. And if we need to slow down, I'll slap it in drive and pull the left regen paddle rather than using friction brakes. But we'll try and keep some momentum through here. Ah, this is what we need. I got the car now down to negative 2% arrival. Here we need a little bit of regen just as an example. So I've just pulled the left paddle once. There's also another level we can pull down, but now, no, too much. Coast, coast. <laughs> Love it. This is, this is great. Audi has sent in the helicopter to get me out of this situation. <laughs> I'm, although I'm making time up, we are starting to get power limit. There's the helicopter they sent. It says negative 1%. I think we'll be okay. I think we can make it. I'm just cruising along gently. But the power limit's starting to cut in as e-trons always do. So actually pretty good to see what happens at the bottom of the pack. And so far, everything is representative to the, uh, to the old car. I think we'll make it. I just don't know the elevation good thing that Audi Nav does factor elevation, which is why I'm trusting this number here, because um, I think that's that's good data. It knows elevation of the road. So I'm just really trying to be gentle on it, eke everything out of it as possible. Great news, friends. We are at 16 miles of range remaining projected and 16 miles to get there. We have officially have a 0% arrival. Just doing typical out of spec, gentle cruising, no regen, just coasting along here. And uh, the magic works. Man, the e-tron is so easy to optimize, to be honest. You can rip it hard if you want to. You can eke everything out of it if you want to. And it gives you all the data. I've very few electric cars have this good route planning and elevation control where I can really dial in my driving style to the percentage arrival. Love this thing. You know, it's one of those cars you really got to dig into menus and figure out how it works. But for an EV nerd, it really gives you all the data you could want. Well, we just got turtle mode up on the display at 4% state of charge. So 4% gives you turtle. I think that's the same as our outgoing e-tron. Man, it's all seemingly pretty different here. I mean, I'm sorry. Everything seems the same, except you do have a lot more range with this new one. I know this is not a good demonstration of the larger battery capacity, but trust me, if I drove our e-tron how I drove this today, we would have been dead a long time ago. Now we're just maintaining speed through some of the best driving roads. Oh, how I wish I could just send it through here. But as you can tell, I've already been sending this car all day. <laughs> and now just cruising on the highway, capacitive steering wheel for the driver assistance. I don't think three miles per kilowatt hour is achievable in this vehicle. It would get well over 300 miles of range if that was the case. But, you know, mid 2.5 seems reasonable. Hypermiling it 2.9. 
Okay, there we go. Maximum speed, 55 miles an hour in range mode, just like old tuning. Um, we're looking pretty good to make it there. 2% state of charge on arrival. So I've just clicked climate control on. It's 91 degrees out. I was sweating, but uh, we got plenty of buffer. So all is good. Let's just hope these charge point chargers are online. Otherwise we're gonna be pushing this thing, but I think they're good. They said they were online, 10 out of 10 on plug share, which we always mean, no, it doesn't always mean 100%, but uh, fingers crossed and just enjoying it. Typical out of spec day of driving, right? Nothing unusual for us. We are now plugged in, it says five miles of range, plenty in out of spec world. We really recaptured a ton. Let's hope this communicates and charges. All the protocols should be really the same as the outgoing e-tron. It's not the most particular car with charging. And there we are, plugged in, and we are juicing. 35 kilowatts. We'll see. It's got to do a little bit more than that, I would think. I would hope. But uh, there we go, 56. Yeah, this car, because it's only a 62.5 kilowatt charger, it's amperage limited. So the e-tron, of course, is asking for more, but that's what the charger can give it. As expected, all is good. We'll charge it up pretty high for the Audi guys, and that'll be that. So as we're charging up after my day of driving the new Q8 e-tron, I'd first like to sort of round up my thoughts on this car in a vacuum and then compare it to its competition. So this car, forgetting about the early one, forgetting about anything else, I know I made a lot of comparisons to the early car. This is a stellar vehicle from the construction to the ride quality, to the way everything feels and looks awesome. Like this is a stellar vehicle. Um, and I actually think it's priced well for what you get. The thing is on paper, the Q8 e-tron will never win. It doesn't have the most range, even in the nicest range ones. It doesn't have, you know, the biggest charging peak speeds. It doesn't have, you know, it's quite expensive. Like it's, it's not really winning in any category on paper, but where it does win is in all the intangibles. And that's why we love our e-tron so much. The seating position, the material quality, the noise performance, the drive modes, the AC system, the the way everything is just so over engineered. Like I bet 10 people named Klaus worked on the door handle alone. The brake pedal is so good. The way they tune the throttle, the way the, the body motions are tuned as well. It's very Audi. It's not oversteer. It just gets the job done and no understeer at all in this. Just a really fantastic handling driving car. Now, a couple things I really, uh, I don't actually know if it's due to the Sportback or due to the Q8 stuff. And we'll have more in-depth coverage, of course, when we get the Q8 SUV e-tron out to uh, Colorado. But the suspension is no question sportier. Uh, this, and, and I believe that's across the board, like handling wise, massively improved. It seems like the team spent all their time tuning the dynamic mode in this car because the suspension's near perfection. Um, steering feel is improved. It's still an SUV and it's pretty soft and there's a lot of compliance, but you know, 50% stiffer bushings up there in the front in terms of lower control arm and steering rack and all of these, that whole area is way stiffer and way more locked in. So loving all of that. The ratio, what I'm talking about is so much tighter on the steering wheel. The rear of the car settled down. It doesn't seem to bounce as much on the back end. So I think all of the suspension and body enhancements certainly are nice. The, um, the downside is all of that performance improvement in my impression right now is you give up a bit on the daily comfort. Don't get me wrong. It's still a comfortable car. It probably still rides smoother than at least the last IX that I drove. It was the M60 version. So hard, hard to make a direct comparison because this, you know, that's a sporty one. This is the luxury one. Um, but it definitely has an odd ride in comfort to where like our existing e-tron has an odd ride in comfort where the back is always bouncing around. Um, but this is almost as like porpoising around. Like they tried to stiffen up the rear, but now the front's doing a little bit of bouncing too. I really need to test out the SUV and I need to drive them back to back to see what's going on. But it almost seems like a little compression and rebound damper adjustment settings just to dial in the car, you know, a little bit more could be done with a software refresh. That would be my suggestion. It's just try and slow down the body motions of the car because it's smooth. It soaks up the bumps really well. It's just kind of, you know, sort of pivoting right around the driver. It's an odd sensation. So that I'm really going to keep an eye on when I drive the SUV. It could very well just be a sport back thing. The next for sure is the sound system. They claim is the same sound system out of the existing car. This sounds nowhere 
nowhere near as good, at least on the base, as our car. When the base hits, when the subwoofer kicks in the old e-tron, it's in the trunk. And here I feel a lot more coming from the front doors and sort of the soundscape up here in the front. And again, that could very well be just the body shape of the sport back and the sound system not being optimized perfectly for this car. Still a stellar sound system. Anyone who gets in here will be blown away, but it seems like just a step down. Again, the SUV, they claim has the same sound system. I have no reason to doubt that. So I'm sure that thing still rips. So in a vacuum, this car rocks. It does everything you need it to do. The charging performance is fine. The range is more than fine now. Um, and I think it's, it's really the right kind of car. When you compare it to Model X and iX, and even Genesis GV70 as an example, um, all of those cars win in some type of category. For example, the Tesla has the best charging network and probably the best driver assistance, although they, all of these cars have great driver assistance. The iX has the most range. Even the least efficient iX, the shortest range, goes farther than the longest range Model X that you can get. We've done that test. The iX goes forever. It has a banging sound system when you get the top one. It's kind of futuristic. It's got carbon fiber reinforced polymer. It's this very future Viet BMW vibe. And to be honest, we don't know if that's going to be outdated or if that's the direction BMW is going for everything. It definitely has an odd styling and a, an odd presence to it. But technically, that car is very impressive. You know, it has, uh, you know, six phase motor on the back. It's just next level all around. Charge is great. And so to, on paper, that is just a clear winner over this car. But again, we don't drive cars on paper. We drive cars on the street. So I think to leave you with my impression at the end of this, especially for the sport back, um, you know, the SUV is really the one to go for in my impression. But if I had to recommend someone one of these three SUVs, if we were to line them up, I would probably recommend someone goes for the BMW iX. It's just the one that makes the most sense on paper. But if you're a car enthusiast, if you appreciate a luxury car, if you're used to this level of quality, only the e-tron feels like a true luxury car. The iX is close, it's got cool materials and stuff. This is nicer in here. It feels more bank vault-ish. The seating position alone makes up for everything. And I just love the interaction with this car. I love the way it looks. I love the way it drives. To me, this is how an electric SUV should be and Audi has nailed it. They have not nailed the efficiency seemingly, Again, I'm not really basing that off of the hardcore driving I was doing well under two miles per kilowatt hour, but trying to eke everything out of it. Again, we were at 2.93 miles per kilowatt hour. Mm, probably not the most efficient thing on the planet, um, but considering how heavy it is, how much stuff they got going on, it's all interesting. So then to leave you on the final thought of, is it worth it over the previous generation? Well, right now I'm feeling like no. Uh, there's nothing here glaring saying this, we have to trade in our car tomorrow because the, the more range certainly is very nice and welcome. Um, but for our use case, you know, the charging performance of our car is truly wonderful. So I really need to charge this car zero to hundred and get an idea of the curve before I make that determination. And I want to run our car alongside. So we'll be doing those videos coming up. Ultimately, the big changes here again is under the hood. It's the suspension, the steering, the dynamics of this car, way sportier, I would say maybe slightly at a compromise of daily comfort. And then, um, you know, it's all about range. Uh, range, that's the big thing. You know, more efficient motors, better range, huge battery now, all good. 80 amp charging for AC, very nice feature. Really like that. So I can't thank Audi enough for letting me come out here and drive the car today. Um, <laughs> I think I probably drove it harder than most people because I was down to 1%, but I really got a great impression of this versus the outgoing car. I can't wait to do all the side-by-side -side testing of the SUV uh, versus the earlier cars. And I'll probably even try and steal like a 2023 from our dealer because I believe there's been some efficiency improvements from 2019 to 2023. Um, so our car may not be the best comparison to use, but we're certainly going to do some interesting things. And so stay tuned. And thanks for watching this long video. My first experience in the Q8 e-tron, highly recommend getting this car. If you're in the market, go for it. I love the first edition. I love this interior. Um, again, this particular one, 96,000 as tested. Flint gray with orange stitching. That's what I was looking for. Go for that interior. This is truly wonderful. The, uh, the launch edition spec in this with the 22s. Money. Thanks so much for watching. See you in another one soon. Bye-bye.